Right. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, about uh, the exciting journey that we've been on in uh, the UK um, to do 100,000 genomes in the health system, the healthcare system. Right. I was given the task by the previous Prime Minister, uh, and uh, uh, we were building on the great heritage of uh, DNA uh, science, genomic science, that we have in the, in the UK. The tasks I were given was to, first of all, uh, create the infrastructure to introduce genomic medicine uh, into the health system. Secondly, uh, to build a uh, genomic and clinical data set uh, in the country of, uh, of a scale at least two orders of magnitude greater than existed anywhere in the world at that time. Uh, thirdly, to accelerate uh, investment in, uh, in genomic medicine uh, in the UK. Uh, and fourthly, and hugely importantly, to carry public support. I could tell you a story on all of those topics, uh, but what I'm going to concentrate on in the few minutes I have with you uh, is the creating of the infrastructure to introduce genomic medicine. So why is this difficult? Well, it's difficult because health all over the world, health systems all over the world are inherently heterogeneous. That is, each part of them, each part of them, each clinic within them, each uh, silo within a hospital can operate almost entirely upon their own data. Uh, and they're under the control of the local clinical specialists. Uh, and therefore, they do, they, they can perform their function basically within their own bounds. Genomics breaks that model because in order to have a, uh, a worthwhile diagnosis on one patient, you have to compare that patient's genome against all the other genomes uh, that present in the same way. Uh, that means you cannot afford local systems to introduce artifacts in their own way. It has to be done in the same way. So this is the first time medicine has to operate on a completely across-system basis. So that's very important, and that means it has to operate to common standards and practices. Uh, and on top of that, there are all the practical challenges of doing uh, the recruitment, the consenting, uh, um, the um, uh, collecting uh, the data, uh, doing the biobanking, doing uh, the sequencing, uh, doing the bioinformatics, uh, correlating with the clinical data, all of that technical challenges are, are there as well. Uh, and so in other words, this is a whole complex system that you have to put in place in order to make genomic medicine work. So, uh, setting off to do the 100,000 Genome Project, uh, how did we go about that? First of all, uh, the government created a wholly owned company uh, to do it. That was actually quite, turned out to be quite an important move, a, actually a very important move, because it brought the various levers of action, notably the money, uh, together in one place uh, so we could operate a, holy, uh, a system within a coherent command structure to uh, achieve this first pilot phase, which is the 100,000 Genome Project. Uh, we obviously worked intimately with the National Health Service and the people within it, and the National Health Service helped us and uh, commission uh, 13 genomic medicine centers across the health system, which themselves uh, coordinated the activity of 85 hospitals uh, within the, the, uh, the, the whole system that we were looking to operate. We built uh, a centralized platform uh, for uh, the informatics, uh, had a centralized uh, biobank, and a centralized sequencing center in close partnership uh, with Illumina. And that was a, th those are 
uh, key platforms which we were able to operate off. Uh, we also uh, built a single uh, safe uh, data center, high security data center, and we initiated a protocol which says the data would never ever leave that center. If people wanted to see the data, or to operate on, or to research on it, or to make discoveries on it, they had to bring themselves to, to our data center. This was crucial in getting public buy-in to what we're doing, and I could tell you a lot about that uh, if anybody's further interested in that. And of course, we had to standardize on uh, uh, common standards and protocols. And to give you an idea of, of the importance of that, is that when our, our target was rare un, undiagnosed uh, diseases and also on cancers. In other words, uh, two disease syndromes, which are clearly diseases of DNA. Uh, in regard to cancer, we quickly found that the standard protocol throughout the world uh, for surgery, which is on taking a resection or a, a biopsy, you dump it in formalin, uh, simply did not work if you're going to do whole genome analysis. You do so much damage uh, to the DNA, particularly ultimately in the extraction of, of the DNA, that you end up with a very noisy genome. And uh, the only way you can get uh, you can get through that noise is by sequencing at colossal depths, and that is just economically not, not viable. So we were faced with looking for alternatives to that, and after a good deal of experimentation, uh, we decided that would be through uh, um, uh, uh, transit, uh, changing the basic uh, protocol to fresh frozen. Now, I was told at the time this is impossible, However, the fantastic news is that the hospitals in the UK have managed to do that. So we have changed protocols en route to a genomic diagnostic to fresh frozen. We've also, we also built out uh, an infrastructure which goes right from the front end uh, to uh, the back end, uh, enabling the movement of uh, samples and data through the system uh, running an automated uh, pipeline, which means you can run at scale of literally hundreds, uh, hundreds a day, uh, thousands uh, a week and, and even more so a month. That's a big task. And we also initiated uh, a back-end research environment, and that's crucial because if you're doing, uh, if you're running an automated pipeline, you can't stop to do research on the way what you'd have to do is use the very best knowledge at that time to get to a diagnostic report, uh, and then mobilize a large community of researchers, 3,000 in, in our case, who can look at that, those data uh, and improve that, uh, that diagnostic pipeline. So it becomes an automatic learning engine. So we did it. We've done more than 100,000. It was a glorious moment uh, in the second week in December when we ticked up over the 100,000. We had a big celebration uh, at that moment. Uh, and it was a wonderful thing because this time last year, I still had nearly 60,000 to go because we'd built the infrastructure and now we had to see whether it worked. And I had four different contingency plans in case it didn't work, but it did. And we got there actually just two weeks early. So, what next? Uh, well, what next is that the government has taken the message that this has really worked in the health system. Uh, and so, the next target uh, is five million, which our new Secretary of State uh, has given us over the next five years. I'm not going to go through all elements of that, but what that says is the UK is absolutely committed uh, to genomic medicine at scale. And why is that? Uh, that's because, A, we can build upon uh, the infrastructure that we have built out uh, in the UK, uh, the informatic infrastructure and the physical infrastructure that we have built out in the UK. Uh, 
And the informatic infrastructure is extremely uh, important uh, because uh, to uh, run it in a way that you can run it at real scale, very, lots of different elements of it have to work smoothly together. Uh, and therefore, a single, a coherent set of applications which work together is crucial to that, and we have built that out. Um, so, where is it, where is it going? Uh, well, it's this, that in the future, as we see it, uh, a genomic uh, uh, test will be available on everybody's health record. That's what we look for. And why is that? And that's because that gives you a background for the individual characteristics of each person to be tested against the way in which they present. And when I say the way they present, I don't just mean the classical uh, health record that you see all over the world today, but I also see, we also see the enormous advantage of what is coming from the digital world where almost everybody will have these things on their wrist, providing real-time data, much more valuable than much of what is on the health record today, plus uh, internet of things data from within their homes and, the, and their offices, which provides a vastly richer source of information about each and every one of us. If you then compare that with the specific data rela relating to an individual, the variants that each of us were born with, uh, we can then relate that to the huge data set which we are collecting for the whole population. And in our view, that will be connected to other populations across the world. So the world overall will be collecting a vast data set of variants and how they can be interpreted. That can be put into a learning engine to provide for each individual as they present uh, with conditions, or even before they present with conditions, with advice as to how uh, to treat whatever conditions they've got, or more particularly, to help organize their lives. Uh, I, I see that uh, prevention is regarded as crucial uh, in, uh, in the Gulf world, uh, and that is exactly how we see it in the UK. Uh, that what we need to be about is wellness, not health. We need not to be focused upon metaphorically putting more and more ambulances at the crossroads of everyone's life. We need to be giving each individual uh, a sat-nav to prevent them having those accidents. And this is how we can do it, by integrating uh, what we're getting about the individual in terms of the variants that they particularly have, plus what we can determine from the now rich set of data about the way they're living their lives, and we can integrate that together into something which is, as I say here, a, a personalized precision health service. And what does that mean for the health service? What it means that put that, that system to operate alongside the enormous strength there is in the academic world to research uh, the insights from the colossal data we are collecting and uh, the uh, capabilities in the huge health uh, pharma uh, industry to create therapies and products uh, which relate specifically uh, to those conditions, what we will do is drive the increasing health, the wellness of the population, and ultimately begin to turn what uh, 
certainly the UK sees it and, and, and the US sees as the health cost challenge to turn that curve so that we create a better, a well population. Thanks very much.